So one of the first kind of optimization problems we're really going to study in detail in this class is the kind of optimization problem that comes up in the context of least squares. So I haven't really said exactly what that is, but one of the situations where least squares arises uh, and is often motivated from is the problem of trying to solve a system of equations. So suppose we have a system of m equations and n unknown. So in general, if we have such a system of equations, we can write it as y1 is equal to some weighted combination of the variables x1 up to xn. These are our unknowns. And we know y and we know these weights. And this is one equation. But then we'll actually have m of these equations. And they might have different values of y, different values of a. But we can stack all of this up. We get m equations with n unknowns, the x1 up to xn. And we're interested in solving the system of equations. Now, whenever we're encountering a large system of equations like this, it's usually much more convenient to express everything in terms of matrices and vectors. In this particular case, we would write this as just y equals ax, where y is the vector of y1 up to ym, uh, x is the vector of x1 up to xn, and then a is an m by n matrix. This is something we'll be working with a lot in this class. All right, so we have a system y equals ax, and the question we're going to be interested in is when can we solve this system? Meaning, when can we find an x given y and a? Well, the answer to this kind of depends a little bit on what you mean by solve, and this usually depends on kind of the relationship between m and n. So in particular, if m is less than or equal to n, it might be the case that there are actually many solutions. So this would be an underdetermined problem. We have fewer equations than unknowns. And in such cases, we can't always expect to recover a unique answer. When m is greater than n, we often have kind of the reverse problem, which is that there's no guarantee that there's even going to be any x that actually will satisfy this equation. So what do we do when we're solving a system of equations? Well, in general, we'd like a method for solving for x given y and a that satisfies three desirable properties. First, if there is actually a unique solution, we would generally like to find this unique solution. However, we'd also like a method such that when there is no solution, it still does something reasonable. And similarly, if there are many solutions, we'd like to be able to have a method that chooses one of them in some kind of smart or uh, reasonable way. So a natural way of approaching this problem that, that definitely addresses the first two of those goals in a very straightforward way is to look at the residual. So the residual I'm going to call R. This is Y minus AX. So this is the part of Y that after you apply a to x, x doesn't really explain. So one principal approach to this problem is to say, let's try to find an x that makes this residual small. Now this naturally leads to the question of, well, what do we mean by small? When dealing with vectors, the natural way of talking about the, the length of a vector is actually using a, a more general concept called a norm. So whenever we have vectors, we're actually free to define a variety of different kinds of distance metrics on this set of vectors. This is something you can read more about in the notes. I'm not going to delve into the details here. But for our purposes, just know that there's actually many possible choices here for how we might actually quantify the notion that we want the residual to be small. But least squares chooses a particular norm here. It chooses what's called the Euclidean norm because this is the straightforward generalization of the concept of length of a vector in just three-dimensional space. So this is just going to be given by the square root of the sum of the squares of the entries in this vector. And we typically denote this using this kind of double absolute value symbol uh, with a 2 underneath it to differentiate it from other possible norms that, that we might use and that we'll encounter later in this course. So to summarize, the least squares approach here is to say we're given y and a, and we are going to solve an optimization problem that seeks to find an x and rn that minimizes the Euclidean norm of this residual. And typically we work with the squared L2 norm of the residual rather than the L2 norm itself, just for convenience. So we don't have to worry about this square root. 
the x that makes the Euclidean norm the smallest is the same x that will make the Euclidean norm squared the smallest. So before we delve into the details of how we're going to solve this optimization problem, I want to say just a little bit about the historical origins of the least squares approach. It involves two familiar people I've already mentioned. So first, we have Legendre. So Legendre published a paper on least squares in 1805, and this was a very clear exposition of the method and applications and it immediately caught on and was taken up by a number of other mathematicians who began working on it. Uh, and Legendre probably deserves all the credit here. He was the first person to write about it, and he wrote about it in a way that made its applicability immediately obvious to his contemporaries. However, shortly after Legendre published his paper, Gauss came along and said, well, that old thing, I did that in like 1795. Uh, maybe 1794. It was a long time ago. Uh, I'm not really sure. So Gauss, by the way, would have been about 18 when when he claims that he invented least squares. But unfortunately, Gauss never published anything about this. There's something important to know about Gauss, which is that he was very thin-skinned in certain ways. So the very first paper he ever wrote got a kind of a, a cool reception as being very difficult to read and understand. Uh, and he really didn't like the criticism. And so, as a result, he became very reluctant to publish. And so, many, many things that he did that would have been interesting innovations that he could have written about just laid unpublished in private notes. So, on the one hand, there's not strong evidence that he actually did invent this. But on the other hand, it's the sort of thing that Gauss easily could have developed. I'm inclined to think that Gauss actually did develop this because mostly why would he make this up? And it seems like something he could he could have done and decided not was was not worth publishing. During this exact same time period we're talking about, he also invented the FFT, uh, and it laid undiscovered in his private manuscripts until the 1980s. However, you might wanna you might ask, well, what evidence do we have that Gauss might have actually done this? Well, there are actually two important problems that Gauss worked on during this time period, where it seems quite possible that he used least squares. The first involves something called the meridian arc. So the origin of this is that in 1793, the French government decided to create what we now call the metric system. And as a part of this project, they defined the meter. And the meter was originally defined by saying that 10 million meters, or 10,000 kilometers, should be the distance from the equator to the North Pole along a meridian line that's passing through Paris. So this definition made it very important to actually know this distance precisely. So a couple of years later, there was a major project involving surveyors to determine this distance as, as accurately as possible. And it involved calculating the distance along this meridian between a number of points. So it turns out that running along this meridian from Paris due north, you get Dunkirk and then eventually the North Pole. Going south, you go through Carcassonne, and eventually Barcelona. And so there was an effort by surveyors to very accurately estimate these distances between the cities, as well as the precise latitudes of each of these, uh, each of these locations. The results of this were published, but a few years later, Gauss finds a typo in the published results. So specifically what he was doing was trying to use these results to determine the ellipticity of the Earth. So all that means is the Earth is not a perfect sphere, and Gauss wanted to estimate the, de the deviation from a perfect sphere. And using these results, Gauss reported that using, quote, my method to determine the ellipticity of the Earth, I get a result of 1 over 50. But uh, he knew that was wrong and determined there must have been a typo, figured out what it was, and said, oh, I, I actually get 187 using the correct figures. Now, we don't actually have access to Gauss's ca calculations, so we don't know for sure if he used least squares when he's talking about my method. However, the evidence does seem to support that he, he might have been using least squares here. Perhaps a more interesting problem where Gauss is suspected to have used least squares involves the calculation of the orbit of the asteroid series. So this is a problem that you'll encounter on the homework, but just to recap, 
In January of 1801, the Italian astronomer Joseph Piazzi discovered an asteroid, which he named Ceres. He was able to observe it for a few weeks before it was lost in the sun. So he collected a sequence of observations of where the planet was located in the sky. So what these looked like were just times measured down to the fraction of a second and very precise measurements of the location in the sky where Ceres appeared. However, this was such a short period of time that it left a lot of uncertainty about what Ceres' orbit actually was. And when Ceres disappeared in the sun, many were doubtful that they would ever find this asteroid again. Nevertheless, the data was made public, and suddenly there was a, a great amount of effort to try to calculate the orbit of, of Ceres to predict where it would appear once it moved past the sun. Now, this is actually a really hard problem, and there was a lot of skepticism about whether or not it was even possible. Laplace, at the time, actually recommended calling off the whole effort and waiting until some astronomer, by luck, might succeed in finding it again. Gauss, a young mathematician trying to make a name for himself, was not deterred and managed to make a remarkably accurate prediction. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism from other scientists and, and led by Laplace, but then later in that year, Ceres appeared pretty much exactly where Gauss had predicted. This made quite a big splash, I mean, it definitely seems possible that Gauss used least squares as a part of this effort. Again, though, we're not really certain. So let's look at this problem again. So to see why this is so hard, notice that at each moment in time, assuming we know precisely uh, the motion of the Earth and its rotation, and we're taking into account the shift in the Earth's rotational axis, uh, optical aberrations in the, in the telescopes, if we do all of that, what we can say is, from specific points, we know the angle that Ceres was at, and this basically tells us that Ceres should live along some line. And we now have a sequence of lines that say the orbital path should somehow pass through all of these lines. On its own, this is nowhere near enough information for us to actually solve the problem. What would make this problem much easier is if we knew the orbital plane of Ceres. So if we knew the plane within which Ceres was orbiting, we would actually be able to just intersect that with these lines. And then what we would have are actual estimates of the position of Ceres at different times. And from that, you would have something like what we're going to look at in the homework, which is a much simpler problem to solve, something where least squares would be a perfect tool. So the real challenge in this problem is actually understanding what plane Ceres is orbiting in around the sun. And this is where Gauss had to use some really clever ideas. It's super complicated. We're not going to talk about it for now. But again, we have some evidence that Gauss was using least squares to solve this, this super hard problem. But in any case, regardless of whether or not Gauss invented least squares before Legendre or not, what's not in doubt is that after Legendre published his paper, Gauss, together with Laplace, made huge strides in, in understanding how least squares would be used in practice and what the relationship is between least squares and various problems in probability and statistics. So in particular, the Gaussian distribution. Right? So where did this come from? It came from Gauss trying to understand the statistical properties of least squares as an estimator. Once this was developed, Laplace was then in a position to kind of really understand the central limit theorem, and this led to huge strides in probability and statistics. So I want to close today by talking about a particular application of least squares uh, that we'll encounter very frequently in this class, and that is uh, the problem of regression. So I've already alluded to this, but the idea is that we have m data points, x1, y1, up to xm, ym, and we want to find some function f of x such that f of xm is approximately equal to ym for all of our observations. If we don't make any assumptions about f, this is a very ill-posed problem because there are any number of functions that could perfectly interpolate the data. So what we typically do in regression is we assume that f has some typical form. So in particular, the most common model is to assume that f of x is a weighted combination of some dictionary or set of functions phi sub n. So that's just to say that we think we can write f of x as a weighted combination of these functions, where those weights are given by coefficients alpha 1 up to alpha n. And the goal here is to determine what these weights should be. So what I'm going to describe here is how you would estimate those alphas using least squares. So recall that the least squares objective that we're going to try to minimize is just going to be the sum of the errors of ym 
minus the prediction at xm given by our function. So we're going to take those errors squared, add them all up. Now note that if we look at this objective function, we can also write this in matrix notation by creating a vector of y's, a vector of alphas, and then filling out this matrix A, which is just going to be given by the different functions that we're using, phi1 up to phi n, evaluated at all of our data points, x1 up to xm. It's easy to check that if you do this, you can equivalently write this expression up above as the Euclidean norm of y minus a times alpha squared. And this is exactly what we encountered before. The only difference is that now I'm using alpha instead of x to avoid any confusion since in the regression context, we're using x to denote the locations of our samples on, on the x-axis. And we're gonna use alpha to denote our uh, unknowns that we're trying to solve instead of x. So before we talk about how to solve this problem in the general case, I wanna talk about a very special case, which is that of linear regression. Specifically, by the linear regression case, I mean what happens if phi1 of x is just x and phi2 of x is just the number one. In that case, our hypothesis for our signal class is that f of x is some alpha one times x plus some alpha two. So these parameters govern the slope and intercept of f. In this case, if we plug this model for f into our optimization problem, everything reduces to a two-dimensional optimization over alpha one and alpha two. Now, notice that this function of alpha one and alpha two that we want to minimize, that I'm gonna call g, notice that this is a quadratic function in terms of alpha one and a quadratic function in terms of alpha two. You may remember from calculus that the minimum of a quadratic function is where the derivative is equal to zero. Of course, you have to be a little worried here about whether or not it's a concave or convex quadratic function. Let's not worry about that for now and just take my word for it that by taking the derivative of this with respect to alpha one and with respect to alpha two and setting it equal to zero, we will find the alpha one and alpha two that minimize this function g. Okay, so let's do that again. So let me go ahead and rewrite g here. And now let's take the partial derivative of g with respect to alpha one. If we do that, using the chain rule, we're going to obtain minus two times the sum from m equals one to capital M of xm times ym minus alpha one xm minus alpha two. Similarly, we can compute the partial derivative with respect to alpha two. We get a similar expression here. And now we can think about setting these equal to zero. So let's set the first one equal to zero, and then we can do some rearranging. So since we're setting this equal to zero, we can ignore the factor of two, and then we can bring all of the negative terms over to the other side, and we get the sum from one to capital M of xm, ym being equal to alpha one times the sum of xm squared plus alpha two times the sum of xm. So we can repeat this process here for the partial derivative with respect to alpha two, and we get another equation that alpha one and alpha two have to satisfy. So now we have two equations and two unknowns, and we can actually express this as a two by two system of equations. So the important thing to note here is that everything in this system except for alpha one and alpha two, we can just directly compute from our observations. And so we can compute this two by two matrix G, we can compute this two by one vector B, and we can obtain our estimate alpha simply by computing G inverse B. Now, since this is a two by two system, it's actually possible to get a closed form expression for what the coefficients look like because there's a relatively simple formula for the inverse of G. I'm not gonna worry about doing that here. The important thing is just that once we get it down to this two by two system, it's easy to solve for the least square solution to the linear regression problem. Now, next time what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this approach that we've developed for solving this special linear regression case and talk about how to generalize this to arbitrary least squares problems.